authenticity. It's being interesting. Like the the obviously the word that a lot of comics use is like the, they'll say hack. That guy's a hack mm -hmm. because he's just doing these old premises that we've all heard, same types of jokes. But hacks can really crush, right? It's not hack if it's not working. Mm -hmm. It's got to work to be hack. But that ends you up on a cruise ship or whatever, where you do great and you kill and it's not easy. It's not like, oh, if you use these hack prints, they still have a real mm -hmm. skill set, you know? But it's not a skill set that will take you anywhere. So, Robbie Slowick, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me here, man. Of course, of course. So, I was listening to a few other podcasts that you've been on as a guest, and one of the common things that came up, of course, was the the way that you grow up, because that's just kind of like the sure. uh, the softball softball question. And I understand that you're you actually immigrated to the United States. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From South Africa. What what is that like essentially living the 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 nomadic lifestyle growing up because I understand you, you came here but you didn't just stay here like you moved around a lot. Yeah, I moved up. around a lot. That's fine. I don't even know what other podcasts I've talked about this on. So you've really done your research. You've really done a deep uh, It was dive a here. very funny woman who had a podcast about drinking. Oh, Caitlin Palufo. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um uh, so yeah, I was born in South Africa, but I, I really left South Africa when I was like a baby and I lived in England the first mm. like six, seven years of my six years really. I spent like a year in South Africa, then I was in England. I moved to the States when I was seven to Tampa, Florida. I was there mm. for a year, then I was in the Cayman Islands for a year, then I was back in Tampa for like three years, then in upstate New York for a couple of years, in Europe for a bit, then back in Tampa, oh, with a stop in the Virgin Islands. So mm. it is, uh, it's, it's interesting, right? You like when you... Because seven, you're still very much a kid, but it's like a transitionary time in your life, you yeah. know, where you're, uh, you know, you like, you pick up a lot of basics in one place. And then right as you pick up those basics, you move to a new place. It's a totally different system and, and, and a way of life. And so that's interesting. I went to three different high schools, two middle schools. Mm. I don't even know how many elementary schools. So yeah. all of that stuff makes an impact. So. That's interesting because I've been around New York my whole life. I live in Brooklyn now. I grew up 45 minutes away in uh -huh. Plainview, Long Island. So I've never really had to adjust during my upbringing teenage years yeah. while I'm figuring out essentially who I'm going to be for the rest of your life. Right. Do you feel like the moving around while you're in that growing up phase, do you feel like that made you figure out who you were sooner because you get to a new school and you're like, well, if my environment's changing around me, like I need to be sure of who the fuck I am right away. Or did it, was it like everything is changing around me so I can't really find my footing? Yeah, I wish at 15, 16, I could have like thought that deeply about it, but mostly you're just kind of it's like go along to get along. Kind mm. of. You know, you're just- It like, took me 28 what? years to think that deeply about it. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was just very much like, what is the landscape here? What's going on here? How do I fit in here? And because I have very like th three very different kind of experiences at high schools, you know, I had, I think I had one where uh, in upstate New York, when I was a freshman, my- sister who was four years older than me. So mm. I was in eighth grade and ninth grade there. She had been like a, a senior when I was in eighth grade at the high school there. And I suddenly like, I was connected to some of her friends there. So I had this experience of being like a ninth grader who was kind of hanging out with a lot of much older kids, like mm. juniors and seniors. And, and it kind of part of that like popular crew there. Yeah, And uh, that was one way of living. Then in sophomore year, I lived in the, in St. Thomas and I just hated that place. It was a, I don't like private school. It was the only year of my life I went to private school and I yeah. hated that and I didn't like so I was like just kind of a loner there I, I wasn't really didn't really have friends it was a different thing then I moved back to Tampa where I'd lived before and reconnected with my old friends who were just kind of like the well liked by everyone but yeah. certainly not like the popular group whatever so I had three very different high school experiences w what did you hate about private school because I actually I went to public school all the way up until high school yeah and then I went to a private Catholic oh, high boy. school, which is like a double whammy yeah, yeah, yeah. in Long Island. Uh, shout out Chaminade High School. I I'm interested to hear what you hated about it, because as I continue to to move past those years and kind of look back on it, yeah. my opinions are swaying back and forth. Like I'm, I'm very in the middle about Interesting. private school. Uh, first of all, just like even as a as a teenager, even at that age, like I didn't like, I don't like like 
I don't love institutions in general, but certainly like, like elitist ones, things that like separate people out by finances. Like that's a thing just even as a kid, I, I didn't like. And this was a place that was very much, you know, you live in St. Thomas, which is you're on a, a majority black place. And then they've made these little comfortable spaces for white people. Mm. And even that at that age felt like this feels wrong. This feels uncomfortable. This feel like, and the school to its credit was probably 50, 50, you know, yeah. uh, as far as like the racial breakdown goes, but still it just felt like these little enclaves, you know, mm. although the, the white people, they go to the private school, then on Friday and Saturday, they meet up at the yacht club. And it's like this whole thing that I just did not yeah. like, and it was geared very much to achievement and performance. Our whole goal is to get kids to go to Ivy League schools. And I even thought that was bullshit. Uh, I'd be yeah. kind of more interested in like, maybe kids should like learn stuff that's interesting rather than be like, we're gonna put you on the conveyor belt to success. It's a yeah. whole elitist mindset that I've hated my whole life. Uh, and and when I was in it, in the thick of it, I, I fucking hated it more. Yeah, you know, it's I, f I feel like that's part of what makes school so weird because I went my entire high school college like even a little bit past college without genuinely thinking what the hell do I want to do with the rest of my life what what semblances of talents do I have outside of baseball I played baseball my entire life was just like set on becoming a pro baseball player had that yeah. derailed by injuries but also just wasn't good enough and I'm sitting at you know 22 23 years old going like what the fuck do I want to do I'm going to have to ask this to myself because not one teacher or one person in school was like, okay, fuck these subjects. Like yeah. when you're separated from learning, when you're separated from this kind of strict environment of sitting in a classroom, what do your thoughts what do you gravitate like? what towards? Are you, yeah, what, what do you, you like? In? Yeah. What do you do for fun? What do you do for free? Yeah. And can that be a track? I feel like that has to be much more of a thing in the educational system with just taking what people like inherently and then working with that person to make it a viable economical, like yes. uh, a sustainable well, thing to do with your life. Schools are, are institutions, right? So they're yeah. driven to institutionalism, right? The point is like, this is a, uh, you, you go here and we teach you essentially like the basics so that you can land at another institution that you can then be a cog in essentially. Mm. Like we're going to, we're going to put you on this track so you can end up working for JP Morgan Chase or whatever it is. It's just like by its nature. And then there is, you can't operate outside of that. They do have like the drama, you know, club and art class and this and that. But for the most part, it's geared to being like, let's get you ready to be a cog in the machine. Yeah. Is, so is your lack of passion for institutions, did, is, did that drive you towards comedy? Because I feel like that's much more of a, if you're good, you're fucking good. And that's going to be the determining factor. Like you'll, you'll get stage time. It doesn't matter if your dad did comedy. Like right. if you're not funny, who gives a shit? Comedy certainly has like an institution within itself for sure as well. I mean, there's definitely like, uh it's definitely there is a structure to it right it, it's not just like a, a free-for-all and certainly like it doesn't matter if your dad did comedy but if he did boy it's probably gonna make a difference if if he was successful you know like, yeah certainly all that stuff is there but it keeps you outside it keeps you on a, on a different schedule than the rest of the world you're not going into an office in that way living that kind of like slog of a life which i lived for a while you know when i yeah. my first eight seven or eight years of comedy like i wasn't making any money i had to work the whole time you yeah know? so i I've, I've lived that kind of double life but the whole goal was like let me get at least to a point where i can earn a living in this so i can stop this other thing yes because yeah. i cannot i can't stand it so were you were you were you sold on just continuing comedy until you were able to make some sort of living with it or was it at the beginning was it something that you wanted to try if this turns into something in five years fine but if not i'm just gonna find something else creative like a like yeah. a creative outlet was it like insert creative no, outlet here no 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 it was always yeah. comedy yeah you know it was always comedy that's the i wanted to do it my whole life i didn't really get the courage to do it till i was about 25 yeah maybe 25 or 12 within like a couple months of my 26th birthday yeah you know so but i'd always wanted to do it but it's fucking scary and you also don't think of it as like a real 
job or career or something with a possibility, you know? So you kind of play it safe. And then well, the first time I did stand up was within two weeks of meeting the first person I ever met who was a, uh, you know, quote unquote comedian. He was an open micer, but mm. he was like, oh, I, I do stand up. And I was like, oh, I've thought about that. And he was like, we just fucking do it then. And I was like, oh. I feel, I feel like we all need that person in yeah. our lives. Like, oh, you like anime? Like fucking make an anime exactly. or try to do some cartoons. You like stand up, do fucking stand up. Like you like podcasts, buy a fucking, you know, backup mic and just talk to someone outside. Just do it. That's yeah. the thing. And, and I hadn't really considered that. And, and I also didn't know where to go. But now I met someone. He's like, I'll show you where the open mics are at. And suddenly yeah. you're in. And that was it. I never really... Had the, like when I started, I wasn't like, this is going to turn into a career for me. I was like, well, yeah. let's just see where it goes. But I know I love it and I want to do it and I would yeah. like it to be a career. Yeah. The, listening to a lot of stand up comedians podcasts and, and I know you're in between podcasts right now. You had Edge Lords. Yeah. I also I, I'm a, a big fan of Tiger Belly, uh, Joe Rogan, like all, all the top yeah. uh, comedy podcasts in a weird way. It's not in a weird way because I could directly connect to how it impacted me. But the way that people talk about making it in comedy kept me going longer with podcasting. I think I hearing comics talk about, oh, yeah, it took me seven years to get paid yeah. doing a set. And I realized how full of myself I was where it's like I'm a year and a half into podcasting and I'm like, I'm not making Where's my half deal? my income Where's my yet. Money? Yeah, Where's like my, my blue yeah, chew like, commercial. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like yeah. they're they're getting like 15k for a blue chew commercial, and like I'm I'm going two years into podcasting, yeah. I haven't made a single dollar yet, and then I'm I'm became a fan of of so many comedians and and podcasts like yourself, where I'm just I'm like, oh, no one talks about this really. Like there are some people that talk about how long it takes to get paid when you craft a path for yourself doing a creative pursuit but there it, it's not really something that a lot of people tell you going into it because i guess it's outside the institution in a sense where you're seeing all your friends that are making these incremental steps yes. in income and that starts to weigh on you especially when you're you're turning down some opportunities to maintain a level of responsibility that you can do your creative side hustle exactly. like turning down the pay in order to be like i need these 20 hours a week to, to totally. do this yeah podcast. i never wanted to be promoted or anything in my like office jobs yeah they were just kind of like paying the bills i didn't want more responsibility i wanted a, as little as possible yeah in those roles but all of those not all of them but like for the most part most jobs have a pretty drawn out career track hey guys this is a quick reminder that the two best ways you can support the show are by one, leaving a rating and comment on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. This is like foreplay for the algorithm because it revs it up and makes our show appear higher in searches. And number two, you can subscribe to Auxoro Premium at auxoro.supercast.com, where for five bucks a month, you get bonus episodes and more exclusive content. Thank you for however you choose to support the show. Right, where it's like, you go to college, then law school, then junior associate, then associate, then partner, or you take that with anything from like yeah. bank teller up to CEO. There's a there's a track for you. Yeah. There's a way to do it. And something like comedy is like it doesn't matter if you're not if it's not hitting after 20 years. Like there there's no track really. Yeah. You know, like and there's all different types of ways to to get that path. There is like you know in the 80s it was kind of like. Yeah, uh, start doing open mics, work your way into clubs, get on the Tonight Show. Johnny Carson goes like this, and yeah, then you calls you over exactly to the calls couch, you to the yeah. couch, and then you tour. You know, for the next thirty years. Like, did you see the the Comedy Store documentary on Showtime? I haven't watched it yet, but I, you know, I, I L A was where I, the first place I moved after I started in Florida. So I was there for four years, and I spent a lot of time at the store. I, yeah, so there's um, like a, a lot of the comics on that series it's it's an amazing series I, I definitely recommend you checking out checking it out but there are a lot of late night tv hosts today that used to be comedians mm -hmm. that people shit on because they're like oh this person isn't funny they're just pandering and i kind of fell into that category where i'll watch jay leno or david letterman and i'm like you know this is kind of funny but how are people watching this right now and then I see them in the Comedy Store documentary and they're absolute killers, yes. like getting on stage at 20, 25 years old. And it made me think about 
what they're doing now differently because I had no idea. I mean, I, I heard names like I heard people say Kinnison or I heard mm-hmm. people um, just kind of like talk about the legends of the past, yeah. like Freddie Prince. But I never actually knew what it was like to be in the comedy store and in comedy back in the 80s. And then it's like you see these guys who are doing stand up every night in hopes that they're going to get a sitcom or they're going to get right. some sort of hosting role. And it just maybe kind of take a step back and think about it differently where I'm like, I'm, I'm judging these guys way too quickly that are comedic geniuses because I'm only seeing kind of the last, like the tip of the iceberg That's of their right. career. Like I grew up with the tip and they're, you know, they've had this whole journey. Yeah, towards and the nature that. of those jobs is like you have to be as broad as possible. You have to be, you know, not as safe as possible. You have to be pretty safe. Like you don't necessarily get to do the thing that you most want to do. You're doing a version of it, but it's not quite that. You're watered down when you're on network TV for yeah. sure. You know? Are you like like does that path exist anymore? Do do comedians think about going through stand up to get to a network TV spot or is it more like it's so saturated now that you just want to get clips up on Instagram and YouTube and then whatever job you can get you can get well yeah it's kind of interesting in that like we don't like the world has changed so much since those yeah. days right we don't have that monoculture anymore of uh you know the tonight show is the dream because it, look it used to be what, what in like the 70s it was like 40 million people were watching the tonight show yeah so if you go and do a set on that and 40 million people see you and you do good you can really sell tickets for years to come but now, uh, you know, it's like on a decent night, The Tonight Show gets 1.8 million viewers. Like that's nothing. I, I You post a video to Instagram and it will get 7 million views if it like takes yeah. off, you know? So it, it, look, it's still a good gig if you can get it and you can get, you kind of sponge off that corporate money because they have a lot of money to give. But it's not the only way anymore. Now people are building their own things, their own, di- you know, direct to their fans their own podcasts and they're making great money and, and uh, they get a more direct connection to their fans and they get to be sponsored like by their fans directly and not have to ask Budweiser, you know, for money. Yeah. I, I heard a a comedian on the, the comedy store documentary. Um, I forget his name, but it's just comic after comic Mm -hmm. coming on and talking about those years and, and goes through the progression. But there was a comic that was, kind of in between going on a late night set like they obviously that was the goal but they're like oh what is it you know fuck it like it's late night i perform at the comedy store every night and then another person in show business told him if you get on johnny carson that's like selling out the comedy store three nights for 50 years straight every single night like that's how many people you're watching and he's like okay like I need to fucking get on the the Tonight Show and kill it. I I think that's a really good way to think about, you know, every just like, uh, you know, a podcast, right? Let's say you're starting out with a podcast and you you have you're new. So you're only getting 300 listeners or whatever. But like for a New York size comedy club, a lot of them only hold 100 people. That's like doing a show for three sold out clubs. You know, it's like it's going to take this almost the same amount of like effort and time put in. So it's like it's a discoverable thing that's there forever, not just like a moment in time that 85 people caught. Like it is a great way to reach people, even if you're not reaching as many as you hope for, like you're reaching more than you'd be able to gauge. And it like in that show individual level. And there's so many people now posting clips and sets on YouTube. It it blows my mind every single day because my lunch consists of, uh, you know, me cooking whatever butcher box meat I Uh have allocated to that day, uh, warming up some leftover pasta from last night and then just searching stand up comedy on YouTube and scrolling through and seeing what pops up. And there are so many people that you know as an audience member i've i've never done stand up but just like as an audience member they're killing like they're they're absolute killers and mm. i did not even hear their name right. before watching this clip yeah and it, it every day like i'm just like how are there this many there's so good many comedians? good comics yeah. yeah and it's just like it, it's 
it's daunting and, and I know podcasting is uh totally different but like in that sense I, I feel you know I, I see so many good podcasts and they're not well known and then that I'm a fan of and at the same time it's just like in this sea of unknowns of people trying to make it and trying to kind of like get their shit out there but it just like it's it's amazing how many people there are that are great so at their many jobs. that are fantastic and that it's like the 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 people country only has like the seeming attention span for like seven or eight big name comics at any yeah. given time that's just like all the market can seem to fit like i remember when i worked in an office like five or six years ago maybe longer now but like there were people going to see louis before all the you know and uh he was at <laughs> madison square garden and this uh amazing comic his name's greer barnes who's like greer barnes yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a killer but like he's not a household name by any means but every yeah. comic knows him everyone in new york knows him. greer barnes is uh, he just destroys and he was opening for louis mm. and so a bunch of co-workers of mine went and i'm not like i i'm not going to go to a comedy show with my night that's a nightmare for me you know mm. so but you're not going to go to a comedy show with your your night exactly yeah like on the same night as your show just i'm not yeah. going to go to a comedy show here i'm just around comedy s six nights a week i'm always yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It, it, you know it's like uh so and the, you get to see it so much i I'm see sure, it so much you're... i'm always around it i'm inundated yeah. by it uh, and I love it, but I'm not going to like, if I have a night off, I'm not going to go to a comedy show. That would be crazy. Yeah. Uh, so I, the next day I was like, how was the show? And and they were like, oh, it was great. But you know, they all almost all of them, it's like six people. They were like, the opener was better than Louie. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. I knew exactly who the opener was. I was like, what's his name? Not one of them. Not one of them knew. They, yeah. they didn't bother to find out. There probably wasn't an easy way for them to find out. It wasn't mm. like written anywhere. They didn't. So it's just like, that's it. They were going to leave the Louis show. The guy they paid to see, they went and paid to see someone. And then they all unanimously agreed. The guy we saw before mm. him was better, but none of them left knowing his name. And that yeah. was just what it is to be a stand up, you know? I mean, I'm guilty of that, too. I literally just said there's so many great comics that are yeah. unknown and, and I didn't name a single one of them. I mean, one now that's getting more well known that I've been following for a few years is Rosebud Baker. Rosebud's and I know she's writing friend. for I, I SNL Rosebud, now. Yeah. And I saw her clips during the pandemic. And, you know, she also um, I believe her husband does comedy, too. So I like saw a clip. Yeah, of their podcast. Andy Haynes. He's really funny. Rosebud's yeah. super funny. Yeah. Rosebud yeah. is kind of, she's like breaking out right now yeah uh, i think it's about to be a big year for her and it's great because she deserves it but yeah uh and yeah. then greer barnes he has that great bit about getting mugged by a white woman uh, like the power of uh, <laughs> I, I, if i told the bit i would butcher it but it's like yeah. if you search greer barnes on youtube and you it, it's probably one of his top clips but it's like walking him uh crossing the street to get away from a, a white woman which like usually it would be the other way around so that's super funny yeah um but yeah like the the amount of talent the, the amount of talent of people who aren't household names it's like it's so inspiring but it's also like how the hell do you make a name for yourself at the same time like i'm going against all these people is it luck is it do i just keep trying harder because you like i grew up in uh like as a, a i guess a baseball raised like yeah. athletic minded person the answer is always try harder if you're not making it it's because you're not trying effort equals success yeah and with creative stuff i'm like yes you have to put in a baseline effort to have a level of success. But also, if you're not taking a step back and thinking about what are you doing, kind of if you're always sprinting on the treadmill going forward towards a goal and you ever like pick yourself off the, off the treadmill, let it run for a little bit, like just walk around outside, be like, what the hell is like, how is my podcast looked two years ago? from now is this is this working is this not working right. and like that all causes you to do less traditional work in the sense like thinking doesn't look like work and it doesn't feel like work but in a lot of ways it's i feel like that has so much to do with the determining factor of, of breaking out in a creative field like thinking about what you're doing taking the time to actually take a step back has it has it been like that in comedy for you 
there's like so many factors to anyone's success, right? And like, sure, luck is like, it's a tiny part of it. I I, I kind of don't like the narrative that like this person like got lucky. Like mm. it's pretty hard work. And then just like, look, I guess the luck of it, right? To some degree in something like sports is like, oh, lucky you, you're six foot seven. You know, like you can't work your way into being naturally gifted. Some mm. people are just naturally gifted and there's no overcoming that if you could go to a, an nba game and you sit close to the court you're like oh these are freaks yeah these are not normal people these are like if you're, absolute if you're freaks. that size yeah. and weight you should not be able to move like this yeah you know no amount of like hard work i'm you know i could work for the rest of my life i'm gonna be an nba basketball player right yeah. it's just not happening but uh there are things you can do you can you know, it's taking the risks, it's working hard and it's trying to ultimately like for something like Santa where there are 10,000 of us doing it, it's finding a way to connect with people. There's a lot of funny people. Tons of people are very funny, but if you're super funny and people laugh and then they, you're forgotten about immediately after, which is most of us to be mm. honest, right? You do a good job, you kill in the moment, but people don't go home and think about you afterwards, then you're, you're missing the mark. You have to find a way to build a connection with people. So is the connection the thing that makes you memorable, regardless of how good your set is? Because I've, I've seen a decent amount of sets. And a lot of times the person I remember is not necessarily the person that was the most funny. Right. Is it just, is it connecting? Is it like authenticity? Is it the willingness to bomb? Like what is the it's thing? It's all of that. It's confidence. Yeah. It's authenticity. It's being interesting, right? Like the, the obviously the word that a lot of comics use, it's like the, they'll say hack. That guy's a hack mm. because he's just doing these old premises that we've all heard, same types of jokes. But hacks can really crush, right? It's not hack if it's not working. Mm. It's got to work to be hack. But- that ends you up on a cruise ship or whatever, where you do great and you kill and it's not easy. It's not like, oh, if you use these hack prints, they still have a real mm. skill set, you know, but it's not a skill set that will take you anywhere. It is being about, be about being more interesting, doing something that other people aren't doing, having a different lane. And, but authenticity, vulnerability, that stuff really matters too. So, Hack may get you more eyeballs and more downloads, whatever it is, but authenticity will make people want to come out and see you. Like yeah. on a cruise ship, everyone's there regardless. And exactly. so if I'm uh, just like as as an audience member in comedy, like if I'm going to see someone and they're funny, like I'll be like, oh, that was a the good set, not knowing any of the nuances of like, to how how to write jokes like yeah. th and and I always look at other comedians that are kind of off to the side and sometimes the person who's getting the biggest laughs the comedians won't laugh you're right but then someone who tells a joke that didn't really hit or maybe like it got three people to really crack up yeah. and the rest of the room is silent and the comedians like oh no like you were right to laugh at that like that's a really fucking good joke yes. his audience suck like the comedians will be cracking up yeah 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 well but a lot of times it's just like it, it's you know i think we see our friends do so well so much of the time that like also when like it doesn't go well those are the fun ones for us to watch because we yeah. get to like it's, it's a different energy kind of fun to watch your friends struggling up there as well yeah. it's just a good time so how did you originally get into stand up? Like what drew you to going to your first set open mic? So I was always, was. always into comedy as I was a kid who watched comedy. I grew up watching comedies like, uh, you know, Mel Brooks and that type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I loved to stand up. I used to, you know, watch Conan uh, as a kid, you know, I was probably th 13 years old or whatever, and I'd watch it for the stand ups, especially. Yeah. I was always watching Comedy Central. A big, like, influential uh, special that I saw early was John Stewart's Unleavened. And, yeah. like, you know, that was probably like 1996. So I would have been like 13 years old. Yeah. And, uh, just like thinking, like, oh, what a different, like, this is, I can't believe you can, like, talk about this type of stuff in this way. Uh, and get laughs off of it. You know, he was really talking about a little bit like some heavier stuff and he wasn't the first to do it as people have been doing it forever, but that was my first like real exposure to that yeah. type of stand up. And then, uh, just, yeah. So I always wanted to do it, but then life just kind of beats you down a little bit, you know, even mm. as a, as like a, a teenager, or whatever, you just get told like, you know, you need to be 
smart. You need to plan for your future. You need to, you need the safer choice. And yeah. so I kind of went in that direction. I, I I went to college and I was like, oh, I'll probably end up going to law school or something like yeah. that. And then I, I realized I absolutely do not want to go to law school. And I just floundered around for three years after college, really. Uh, I was a weighted tables, whatever, valet yeah. parked, random stuff. Uh, and until I met that guy, his name's Errol Johnson, I think, who I don't think he does comedy anymore, yeah. but he was the guy. And, and I, he just told me, oh, I do stand up. And I was like, I've been thinking about doing it. That was it. He said, just fucking do it. And I did it. I never looked back. Did you, did you get to the point before you did your first set? Like my, like whatever was going on in your life, like this, this is going so unlike what I thought it would go, it's actually hilarious. Like, did you start finding things hilarious before you stepped on stage? Or was it once you tried stand-up comedy and you got addicted to that, you're like, I need to start finding this uh, mundane I had shit hilarious? I've always been like writing a little bit. I okay. always, when I had funny thoughts or whatever, I would like kind of like throw it in a notebook or whatever. Just I would try to like remember stuff. And uh, I was always interested in like jokes and joke structure and that type of stuff. So when I went up for the first, the first time I went up, I, I picked a place that was intentionally like 45 minutes away from where I live. Cause I was yeah. like, I don't want anybody I know to see me. I didn't really tell anyone. I was the only person who knew was my girlfriend at the time. Like going to a peep show or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. It was like, I was truly hiding, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I even told her not to come. I was like, I'm, I'm just going to go alone. I don't want anyone to see this. Yeah. And, and I went and then right as I'm called up on stage, like she had snuck in. She, like came to see me and she got a ride from this was my girlfriend she got a ride from the guy that she is now married to uh mm. so they came there in together go. yeah uh but also we you know i think within nine months of me starting stand-up we broke up and it's like if you're this is for everyone out there if you're in a relationship and w your partner decides to start doing stand-up your relationship is over that is something is wrong there's a reason they're they're driving to do it it's going to it's the end of your relationship so if, Just, if if you are already in stand-up and then your partner decides to do it not even if you're in already in if, if you're in a relationship where neither person is doing stand-up and one person is like i'm gonna start doing stand-up just end it right there and the relationship that, right there that's just like the the nail in the coffin like let's just call this call what it is and i've seen it i've never once seen one person starts stand-up comedy and the relationship survive yeah do you go to see your partner and heckle them on stage before you break before up before you break up and then you like build your own sense of comedy and then you start doing stand up and then you pass them and you're like i was just using you as fuel for Maybe my that's the move. for my hour yes. for my first hour yeah 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 <laughs> that's the move for yeah. sure yeah uh, and uh, well, my wife now is like, she's a comic as well. So, uh, we, we try not to heckle each other, but we definitely do a bunch of shows together. Yeah. What is it like being married to someone who's also professionally funny? Cause like, we all think we're funny. I think I'm funny. Like my girlfriend tells me that I'm not all the time and that doesn't stop me from going on <laughs> rants to entertain myself. Yeah. Like pure self entertainment, like being in a relationship with someone who is quick back and forth like they'll say shit you'll say shit yeah does that is there like a different energy when you're in a relationship with a stand-up the nice things about well like i think you can tell even from talking to me like but neither of us are the type who's like on all the time you know at home or not it's not like a fucking screwball comedy from the yeah. 40s or uh no this but. is this is on for me in mm -hmm. uh in in shorts uh, wearing socks yeah, and yeah. like sitting in terrible posture on my couch. Uh, like I'm like flicked on. I'm like 120% right on. now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are really different types of comics. So we like compliment each other very well in that like she really talks about herself and how she's feeling and what's going on in her life. And I really don't look inward like that. I look more outward. I talk more about the world and uh, mm. we have very different styles. Uh, she's a big like performer. I'm much more reserved. Uh, and so it's like, it's nice to have that balance and we can definitely run stuff by each other, but we don't like overdo it. But it's nice to just like when you're pursuing something, you know, uh, like in the early days of it, it's nice to have someone who understands when you're like, hey, I, I just got this spot that I've yeah. been trying to get forever. And so I can't, I can't go to dinner or whatever. Like someone who understands that. Uh, mm -hmm. it's you and that's one thing you see break relationships apart when someone starts doing stand up they start to be because like, of the commitment like they don't understand I, it, you know you're working a job but you're also going six nights a week to exactly or and, something and like so that. much of it just see if someone from the outside would be like this just looks like you're hanging out mm -hmm. you're like it does look that way but like this hang is actually important 
because I need to be around this thing to meet these people to do blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. Do you have moments where something happens with your wife and she's like, you do not tell a joke about this. Like you're not allowed to talk about this. Like it happens and you both look at each other and you know, you're like, I'm yeah, one I, of us is going to say this on stage. I think because we're both standups, we wouldn't, I would never put any constraints on yeah. her. You know, it's like, you don't want to limit anyone, even if you're going to come up looking horrible and whatever the thing is, like you want to make sure they're free to do what they want to do on stage. That's important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the creative freedom seems like it's something that's just super necessary for anything creative. And, and sometimes you put those restrictions on yourself. Like I've given myself so many restrictions in podcasting where I'm like, okay, I've either heard someone else do a podcast like this, or I did a podcast like this and it worked or like I set up my notes like this and this worked and I go back and forth all the time. Even right now, I'm like, I have to do a podcast with zero notes because that is a true conversation. Like right. you can't have a conversation with someone with notes there. That's just like fake shit. Cause you're always thinking about your notes. I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at notes now, but I'm still able to have a conversation. That's yeah. just something you learn. But then I'll swing back the other way and I'll be like, you know, fuck that. Like a podcast is different than an everyday conversation. Totally. And then I, I, and then the next day I'm like, why am I putting these restraints on myself? And I actually, I, I came across a quote, uh, I'll have to like put it in the notes who it was I'm forgetting but it, it was you never learn how to write a novel you only learn how to write a novel you're on uh -huh. and so I kind of just applied that to podcasting where I'm like okay you just did a podcast that's either terrible decent or great but whatever it was that just worked for like that podcast and that guest and whatever it is so like stop putting these constant constraints on yourself that just because this worked one time means now you're in a you're shackled yeah. to like the 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 greatness or the 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 horrificness of what just did well or what just bombed you on have to be flexible and able to adjust and all that stuff but like putting restrictions on yourself isn't as it, it, that can be a good thing right they yeah. can drive you to be better to do a certain thing because if you don't you can you can find yourself resting on the easy stuff mm. so saying ah, i'm not going to do i'm not going to talk about this i want to try to talk about other stuff or whatever that is like putting restrictions on yourself just fine you know putting restrictions on someone else or having restrictions put on you that's fucked yeah you know? yeah so when you're trying out new jokes just to take a, a restriction for example i've heard a lot of comedians that will say i will start with something that's proven it's proven to be funny and then i'll mix in new jokes in the middle yeah maybe the re entire rest of the set will be new jokes is there a way that you try out new material or is it just kind of whatever you're feeling that night you'll it's, slide it in somehow it's a combination of what i'm feeling and where i am like where the set is makes a big difference what club mm. there's some clubs where i'm just so like comfortable at where it's like fuck it i'm gonna open with new out the gate it's not gonna yeah. make a difference there's other clubs where i'm like a little less comfortable or my relationship with them isn't as good so it's like i will bury some new stuff in the middle sometimes there's new stuff that's connected to old stuff so it has to go mm. before or after it you yeah. know you're building on something uh but i try to like i try to go up with the confidence of like ah, i'll just do new stuff right out the gate yeah yeah that that seems like it would be a constant battle trying to figure out where a bit stops because yeah. it, it starts as an idea and then you keep building on it. Maybe something works. You take away a piece. Like how, how do you, how do you know that you're done with that joke? Like it's time to transition into, into something else. You're never fully done. Cause you can always, something can always hit you and, and like a and, tag or a something tag like that. Yeah. or a new tangential thought that's related that you're like, Oh wait, I can actually weave this in or this yeah. becomes part of this. So you're never fully done, but you, there is a point where you're like, this one is good enough now that I would comfortably do it on TV or a special as is. That yeah. doesn't mean it's done. It can always be improved, but like this is good enough now that this is a staple solid. Yeah. Bit. Are you a word for word guy when you write it out or no. is it more like bullet points? I'm a bullet point guy. Just go with an idea. Yeah. Generally what I'd like do sometimes I like I do write a lot on stage when I'm also just sitting and writing. I will uh, basically I would just bullet point out as much stuff as I can. Like I'll have a, a, a concept uh 
And then I will write like as many bullet points as I can. And then the, I like bullet points because then I can move them around. So I just yeah. will free flow thought, 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 as many thoughts as I can. And then I'll kind of look at them and be like, well, this can go here. This can go here. Get rid of this one. Get rid of this one. Move this one to here. And before you know it, you have like a structured bit with an in and an out in a direction that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I mean, I've done kind of both approaches with podcasting where I'm like, I need to write out everything I ask word for word. And then oh. other times I need to just put a bullet and whether or not I even bring it up, you kind of just glance at it and run with it or something like that. And for me in the beginning, I was literally writing out intros. Like this whole thing would be filled with paragraphs of like word for word, you know, like, thank you, Robbie Slug for oh, joining yeah, me on the podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. today. Like, well, and then gradually it just became like more sparse and sparse which is hilarious because i still have two pages here just in case you know uh -huh. I, I somehow forget to speak words but like the there's something about the magic of just having two words to spark something in your head and then part of the the content is just however your brain forms it in that moment based on all these different factors like the audience what you said before, things you probably aren't even aware of, like energies in the room. And then that all comes together into the shit that's coming out of your brain that no one else will really ever hear the same way again. Right. Like it's just like in that moment, bam, like whatever, I'm just going for it right now. Yeah. And that's look, the, the, like there's a comfort to having a safety net for sure. Uh, but there is a, like a freedom to not as well, yeah. you know? And so when you get to like abandon that and you're just like kind of flying by the seat of your pants in the moment, that's when the more interesting things yeah. can really happen. Yeah. Do you remember the first joke or series of jokes that you wrote where you said like, I'm on my way, like this is professional shit. What I just performed, what I just wrote, you could see like – Oh, this is what people talk about when they're a pro comic, like that feeling. Yeah. As far as like writing itself, I don't know. I, but like there are moments with performance like that. You know, I think I'm someone who my first like four or five years, people would come up to me after a set and be like, man, you are such a great writer. You're mm. good. I'm, I'm not saying that to be a dick. Uh, they'd be like, you're such a good writer. And, but you as a, as someone who's performing, you feel like I'm all, what I'm hearing here is like, is almost an insult, right? Yeah. What I'm hearing is like, oh, you're really good at writing, but you suck at performing. Yeah. You know, and they're not quite saying that, but they're kind of saying that because when someone has a great set and they're fun, you just go up to them and say, man, you're so fucking funny. Yeah. You killed. But they weren't saying that. What they're saying is, you're a great writer. You're so a great writer. Yeah. My writing from the out the get go was always good, you know, solid. When you're a beginner, you're a beginner and there is such a thing as beginner writing. You can really spot it when you're a comic. Usually I can tell up until about the five year mark how long someone's been. I can usually look at someone mm -hmm. and be like two years, four years. You can see, you can watch the evolution of writing and everyone is pretty similar. Mm. Uh, but it was my performance that took a long time, a long time to catch up to my writing. It's, I So I used to think that uh, and and again, like this is not coming from a, a professional standpoint at all, because I've literally never done stand up. But in terms of just watching comics do it on stage, I used to think that I had a good idea of how long that person has been doing stand up. But I would never really know unless I wanted to talk yeah. to that person after the show. And then I started watching Kill Tony, which is yeah. the live stand up show that's yeah, now Tony's down in buddy now, yeah. now down in Austin, Texas. For people that don't know, he has comedians sign up for a bucket and he picks names out of the bucket randomly and they go on stage and perform a minute and they'll talk after that for the episode but there are people that have killed so hard for that minute mm -hmm. and again it's only a minute yeah so, um and i'm like oh this person's a seven year eight year comic and they're yeah. like i've been doing this for six months and then there's some other people that just completely eat shit but they're like oh i'm a 12 year comic right and Tony's like shut the fuck up yeah like, you've been doing this for like two months yeah um but that that show is it's a uh, it's really cool to see how quickly people can become good at performing comedy in uh, in a short period of time like right. even if it's just only for that minute like right. it's it's uh, it's like inspiring in a way because as a like as a creative i feel like my I, i'm just my inner monologue is i suck i'm fucking terrible and, and some days that's true 
And I always think that how good I am is linked to the amount of time that I've been doing it. But there are some people and, you know, you get good at it quick, but then it's just learning how to present that better or like how to build that out and just make it into something that's 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 longer like it could be a full yeah. comedy set it's yeah a cool show to watch there are like phenoms but then there's also just like the more you do it you pick up like trade craft and you learn mm-hmm. to to go deeper on topics that there sometimes there's stuff where it's like i had an idea jotted down like you know six years ago that's like i never i couldn't i had a thought but i couldn't conceive of how to turn it into a bit and then you look at it years later and you're like oh i know now how to i can do Mm. this i can turn this topic into a bit you know it's like your brain was before your skill level in a way like you had an idea you had a you had a premise that you couldn't you didn't have the skill to flesh out at the the time and then you remember it and you're like oh like this obviously is where i go with this now exactly i've been doing this for 10 years or whatever yeah that's exactly right Yeah. yeah what is it like um writing and working with John Stewart cuz you're you're a writer on the, yeah. the problem with John Stewart he's such a legend yeah. um now just generally to the general public but started off as a, a stand up comic what is it like working with a guy like that and seeing him take your writing mm-hmm. and bring life to it like it just not that your writing doesn't have life but like no, some, someone that's like taking it and just being like i'm gonna run with this maybe they'll say it word for word maybe they'll add shit to it john is awesome i mean he's like he's just like the best and one thing he does really well is elevate whatever's given to him like he's actually kind of like it's funny because i i'm uh, i write for him there's a whole team of, of of writers on the show you know there's like eight of us and but he's pretty resistant to saying other people's words verbatim, Mm. you know, he's not really going to let you like directly put words in his mouth, Mm. you know, like he will take what you give him. And occasionally look, certain lines make it in here and there, but like for the most part, he's going to synthesize it directly through his voice. He's going to twist it. And what he does the best is he's going to elevate it. You know, Mm. when he puts it into his voice and and puts a little like spice on it, like he will elevate it almost every time. It's really fun to watch it's really like lucky to get to write for someone like that there's definitely people you can write for where it's like they're just gonna they're gonna say what's on the page and john is not that way yeah so he'll he'll take a a bullet point or a joke or something like that just kind of have it in his mind and then he'll expand on it on camera he's a really fantastic performer that like you might be like he's so seamless you might not notice how strong of a performer he Mm. is but like yeah he'll take it He'll make it better. He'll probably punch up the wording even. At the very least, he'll put it directly into his voice. And yeah. Like, he just, yeah. He, and then he'll sell it. He'll go out there and really fucking sell it. Yeah. Like, it, it's so it's so good and it's so funny. And with the with this show, Problem with Jon Stewart, you guys are making fun of things in an attempt to change if i'm saying the, the mission right. correctly you want to actually change shit yeah. so there's always there, there's a laugh but then there's also like oh shit like this is kind of exposed now like i, I wrote down um one of my thoughts th- this was uh after watching the the burn pit episode yeah. and i wrote down that comedy is like surgically unclogging an artery to clear a path for the obvious to flow back in. And it seems like a lot of the things that you guys tackle as a team on the show are just like obvious things that people should be afforded, but we've become so defensive as a culture where we build up these walls. And it's not necessarily like the idea is being put into the viewer's mind. It's like we've built up so much defensive bullshit that once comedy kind of fucking drano releases the tension like releases that out the obvious just kind of comes in like a vacuum and you're just like why don't we pay veterans that yeah. got cancer from serving yeah. in iraq and like and, and shit like that so that's like yeah the, the show like we do have some general episodes but for the most part like the goal of the show the show at its best i would say is when we can take an issue that is impacting a specific 
community, something that isn't too big to to actually make an impact in, you know, something that, that has a specific thing that needs to be done and just try to like spotlight it and help yeah. the people who are really driving towards a solution drive to a solution. So the burn pits thing, which was the first episode of last season, also by far and away our least funny episode because it was such a like personal issue to John that he was kind of like, I don't really want to be that funny here. I yeah. just kind of want to lay out this yeah. important thing, you know? Uh, but the Burn Pits episode, you know, for anyone listening, if you don't know, and you probably don't, because I didn't until I started working at the job. Yeah, like, same, uh, same. When uh, our troops were in Afghanistan and Iraq, when you invade a country, which is f- kind of fucked of us to do, but let's skip over all of it's that a, stuff. It's a pastime. It's yes, a pastime. it's an American yeah. tradition, yeah. yeah. Uh, no one plans for what do we do with all of the garbage that this is going to create. So the way they handle that is they would dig giant pits just next to bases, the size of f- multiple football fields, multiply and throw every all of the garbage, mm-hmm. all of the toxic waste, clearing out the porta potties, uh, surplus, broken down tanks, tires, vehicles, cleaning weapons. out a porta potty, a single porta potty on its own is probably enough to give you cancer. So the totally. fact, the fact that you're putting all that shit into all a of mismatch. That. Of uh, like a tanker size field is crazy. That's right. Then they would cover it in jet fuel and just light it on fire. Yeah. And they would keep throwing stuff into the pit, lighting on fire. And these big plumes of black smoke were next to the bases and that they were blowing over the soldiers. These things were burning 24 mm. seven and these soldiers were breathing them in and they were getting these very, well, they would come back and then 10 years later, get these super rare cancers mm. that were very clearly linked to this. But the Pentagon and the uh, VA kept saying, eh, there's no direct proof that these cancers are from breathing yeah. in this toxic waste. There's no direct proof from the studies that we're yes, funding. Yes, the studies that, that we're that funding. It, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, we're not going to cover this as service related. Yeah. And veterans were dying at alarming rates and these are people that the government promised them you know so this was just like john did with 9 11 first responders he took on this fight he worked you know he's not like some celebrity who's like gonna make a commercial and you know rock the vote or whatever like he's driving down to dc regularly lobbying mm. congress people senators what going to meetings with veterans who are fighting for this and as of you know i don't know when this is going to come out but as of two days ago probably like the three three four weeks something like that okay so yeah. and then as of a month ago for you listening there we go <laughs> the senate passed the pact act literally two days ago yeah. from when we're taping it and that now it has to go to the house but the house is expected to pass it and it's going to give uh coverage for these cancers Mm. To the veterans who've been suffering from it and who've been put through the ringer and paying yeah. out of pocket and like it's going to make a real difference. And to be part of a show that was a small part of a show that was a small part of that process, it is amazing. You never expect comedy to be able to do something like that. Yeah, it's a, something that I noticed watching the the Burn Pit episode the was it a senator he was interviewing i forget the that was who the guy's the status was secretary of veterans affairs secretary of veterans affairs um he seemed like he had a passion and a will to help out the veterans and then when he was confronted with some tough questions by john stewart he went back to the same talking point without actually thinking about or answering the question or just saying like, I don't know, but he kept saying something like we're waiting for the regulations to supersede this boundary before we go forward. And John's just like, what the, like, what is this thing that you're waiting for? And then kind of talk for another couple minutes. And then the guy's not able to define it. So I think it's cool the the work that you guys are doing, e- even if it doesn't have a direct legal change, like in the case of the burn pit episode, but just like forcing politicians and forcing people in power to define problems. Like yeah. For so long, we've been kind of walking through life and being fed this bullshit on this is what's causing the problem and this is what we're doing to solve it. And it's like, no, wait, like that does not connect at all. Like, let's let's take a step back here. Let's redefine the problem or just define it correctly in the first place. And a lot of people aren't even able to do that. Right. Yeah. Well, a lot of these like a lot of government institutions operate kind of like insurance companies as well, where they're like, how do we avoid paying out? 
these claims yeah. or whatever. Like how we are, we have an operating budget. We need to maintain it. And it kind of pits them against the people in some yeah. ways, which is like the opposite of the intended purpose of them. Yeah. You know? And l- legal industries, especially it's like when you're trying to pass red tape, I feel like a lot of time in the past, the the people in power in those positions have been able to rely on the complexity of the language freaking people out and they're not able to kind of go past the insider baseball language of a certain industry and it seems like people aren't willing to put up with the, like oh this you know i don't understand this contract or what this law is really saying so i'm just gonna like trust it in the hands of the government like they'll take care of it now people are more like no like tell me exactly what the fuck this says like define this for me like you're not talking to someone else that also you know works in the defense industry like just tell me straight up what is happening here people aren't willing to accept just kind of the the the, what do you call the verbose definition that doesn't actually make sense right and a lot of that complexity is intentional complexity like to make things more difficult so someone like a you know va secretary mcdonough can hide behind like well i can't do it until i get it from this department who's waiting on this thing from this department so and it's like a big circle that's essentially designed to to bog the whole thing down so nothing can get done yeah and when you have an episode that's 45 minutes you can't go in circles and run out the clock like you can on cnn or fox news or whatever where you're just like i'm just gonna say the same shit the host is gonna say and that's our time like we have to go to the next person or there's five other people on a panel you there's just the awkwardness of sitting in front of someone and explaining to them the thing that you can't explain to yourself yeah Exactly. Yeah. And John is really good about pressing, you know, because the thing is the, the the advantage on our side, on his side, is that we're not access journalists, you mm. know, CNN, they they have to keep getting the interviews. So if their people get branded as like their dicks who are going to keep pushing, uh, they're not yeah. going to get the access they need. But we don't need constant access. We're not journalists Mm. that way you know john just needs to get in and get out and that's done so he's not playing the access journalism game so he can keep pushing and pressing for the answers that he's looking for so so someone like cnn has a locked in spot to talk to people like i know next to nothing about like the journalist bureaucracy but they'll just however good their journalism is whatever questions they ask they'll have their spot locked in and if they start to cause problems the government organization will be like actually you're not invited to the next one or something to some degree it's like less about that and more about like someone like cnn their whole operation any media thing their whole operation is getting news right and that's based on relationships it's based on what will people tell you what are they willing to tell you who's willing to grant you access to an interview this Mm. and that right so they have to manage that they yeah. have to be like, I can't burn this bridge because I need to get to this person, right? Yeah. So they have to, they have to be very political in their decisions, right? Yeah. They need that access. I need to keep a good relationship with the press secretary if I want them to leak something to me. Because sometimes, let's say, like the the a president has something coming down the pipe that they can't make the announcement of, so they want to leak it, right? That's a regular thing that happens, and then the press secretary essentially chooses like who to leak it to. Mm. You want to be the person that gets the leak. So you have Mm. to manage that relationship. But managing that relationship means you're not going to be a dick and push on this other thing because you want to be the person who gets the leak. And we're not playing that game, right? So we get to push and we get to be dicks, kind of. Yeah, and and the ability to be funny on command and work that into an interview, both as writers and as a host, it seems like it's, it's something that the average person may not even be aware of that's part of the interview. Like, oh, I'm being disarmed now to give a better answer yeah. because this person made me laugh. And you could see that in real time with a lot of the episodes where it's like, oh, you know, pressing, 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 and then nothing's happening. Make light of something. The person's like chuckling and then says a phrase where you're like, oh, shit, like, yeah, never heard that before. Yeah. Like, where are we going? So it's like... uh humor is such a powerful weapon that doesn't get the credit it deserves for pushing forward the conversation like just outside making people laugh it's like if you're a brick wall just having a conversation with someone 
and then you make a joke like that person is now like a little bit more jello like yeah. you can like kind of reach into a person more with with the comedy is very disarming and charming at the same time like yeah. you can you can really cut through walls with it for sure how is it writing jokes specifically for the problem with john stewart where you're trying to change something with bureaucracy uh versus just writing something on stage to be funny oh, or maybe you're trying to do both it's on stage. so different yeah it's a it's a totally different thing first of all you're when you're writing for john you're writing for john that's someone else's like voice and and uh point of view you're helping someone else bring their vision to life mm. uh and so those are those are going to be like harder. They're jokes. They're they're they can be uh you know pretty specific on a specific topic. They're written to to fall within the context of a script. It's very different than stand up where you have to create all the your own context. There's no mm. other tools. No uh you know over the shoulder pictures and headline pulls and you know it's a, it's a it's a whole different thing. And it's going to be much more personal and about your worldview rather than you know. The, the economy or the stock yeah. market or whatever. Dude, I mean, tell writing jokes about g – there are a lot of jokes about topics like gun violence or corruption or racism, mm -hmm. but writing jokes with the thing in mind that you want to not only just make people laugh, like th there's something beyond – making this funny it it has to be funny but also lead towards an overarching change that seems like it would be so difficult to to yeah. keep in mind while you're writing like I, okay I, is this funny but like also is this going to lead to this i think with the jokes themselves you're not thinking like is this going to or you sh probably shouldn't be thinking like is this going to spur change you know mostly yeah. you're just like is this going to help make this subject matter palatable to people? Mm. Is this going to make be the thing that people can now sit down and like watch this complicated thing about a thing that kind of sucks, makes you angry? Like, yeah. will it make it like enjoyable enough for them? To, is it like the spoonful of sugar that'll help the medicine go down, so to speak? Is there an episode that was particularly difficult to write spoonfuls of sugar for where you're like, how the fuck are we going to make this palatable? Yeah. In like the, the comedic form. You know, honestly, the, I, I, burn pits probably would have been the one. Yeah. But John, like by just design, was just like, I, I'm barely even interested in making this one funny. Yeah. And it's like really tonally different from the rest of the series, which is interesting because it was our lead off episode. And that's the only one like critics will watch and like review. Uh, people don't watch the second episode to review it. They watch mm. the first. So there's a lot of these reviews of like, oh, John Stewart, not funny anymore. More serious John Stewart. You know, it's like, yeah. and they're kind of right for that episode because he kind of yeah. made a, a, a conscious choice. Yeah. Uh, but the rest of mine, we definitely have an episode about like, you know, we have, uh, there's episodes, there's an episode about the stock market that is mm. like when it's very complex. So it was like, how do you write jokes for something while getting the complexity of this issue across? Mm. And those are when it gets like, those are the fun challenges. Yeah. Like the, the Redditors exposing the, the stock market exactly. with GameStop. The GameStop yeah. thing. And yeah. there's like, when you pull, when you learn all about the machinations of that, of like, you know, payment for order flow and dark pools and how, uh, you know, high frequency traders and uh, these micro trades being made in milliseconds. You're learning about all of this stuff and it's a lot and you're trying to convey that to people and we're definitely not experts. We are talking to experts to make sure we're getting stuff right. Uh, but it's like injecting jokes into that while keeping the nuance of all the information is a, is a challenge. Yeah, the, the Redditors taking over the the stock market in a sense and forcing the big guys like the hedge fund guys to just put the stock market on hold that was a crazy thing to watch like i'm i'm watching that thinking you know like these guys in a reddit group that i had no idea existed the week before this happened have yeah. been planning out this intricate nuanced thing for years and yeah. then they just fucking like hit the button exposed everything like almost a laughable in its own way to think that a bunch of people on Reddit could go against the billions of dollars yeah. that's funding these types of corporations to make sure that you stay down. Like we're pressing you down. We're going to make money for ourselves. So that that was just a, an insanely crazy and also eye-opening thing to watch. They did what the big boys do and they beat them at their game. 
And so the big boys t rallied around, you know, the, their own networks like CNBC and the Fox business and the financial stuff to, and, and to get called, you know, like all, these guys don't know what they're doing. They're amateurs. They're actually going to break the system. It's like, no, mm. they're, they're doing exactly what you've been doing the whole time. You're just mad because they won. Yeah. It's like if the, the system isn't working the way that you would like it to work, then the system is broken. It's, it's like you're you're not really looking how the system is functioning as a whole and recognizing that these people are exposing weaknesses in the system. You're right. just like, oh, it's broken. Like, we got to stop it. Like, plug it up. It's like, oh, like, hold up for a sec. You're like, this is the system is fine. The system yeah. that's been set up is working exactly how it's supposed to work. It's just that people it. have stop gapped it yes. and used your own technology and your own infrastructure to their advantage. So exactly. now you're just pissed off. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So one one thing that I noticed in the j just looking at different episodes of the show scanning through YouTube is that around the time of the problem with white people episode mm -hmm. there were a lot of people that came out and said John Stewart went woke like uh -huh. it was like a a planned decision to shift ideologies to cover his own ass in a way uh -huh. and that is sort of a like th this is how i think about it that's like a a hack thing from the right side to say like oh this person went woke they want to cover their own ass they're like bowing down to liberal media and the same thing on the left side people will be like oh this person's alt-right like if they're just down the middle yeah. As a writer on the show, like you're seeing all the ins and outs, the day to days. Could could you speak to the decision and what it was like prepping for an episode like that? The problem with white people and everything that went into it, just like the the, the direction you decided to go yeah. as a team. Everything happens kind of incrementally, you know, like everyone who works on the show and, you know, there's, there's eight writers, but there's like 80, a staff of like 80 people totally. Mm. You know, there's a research department, there's a footage department, there's a legal department, there's all this stuff, right? Mm. Everyone is free to pitch episode ideas and those all get kind of filtered through a system. And then ultimately like, you know, there's a 99% chance that John is just going to kind of go with his own pitch or he's, he'll take a pitch and kind of twist it to be more a version of a pitch he's interested in. So we knew we wanted to talk about like, you know, I think race relations. And so we landed on uh, this take that was, it was, you know, essentially John's take, but it was not, nothing is as intentional as like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my image. So I need to make this statement or yeah. whatever. It's just like, uh, you know, race is a hot button issue. People are talking about it. John has an opinion. Let's, let's talk about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, it seems like that's a a problem, or not a problem, but a, a, a dilemma that a lot of content creators have in general, which is I genuinely have this view, but is this going to cause me to lose audience members or is this going to get the amount of viewers that I need to sustain myself or build towards sustaining myself for a, a living creatively? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of it is just like, uh, you know, like this is either nuance like it's not a hard take or this take is not in line with everything that i've said or, or it's like it's going to be an unpopular thing people are going to call me out for just like bowing down or bending over or something like that so i'm going to just skip over this or, or just do something completely different it seems like that's uh like it, it has to be a challenge to write in a landscape like that where the algorithm is hitting back in the sense where you know what you want to talk about, you know how you want to say it. And then this thing that 10 people in a room in Silicon Valley decided, decided is going to determine how people, like who this is going to reach, how this is going to get to them and shit like that. Yeah. Well, this is the nice thing about like stand up in, in a club, right? Is that uh, really like by, by nature, you have to try to write stuff that will land with as many people as possible, right? So you want to talk about politics in a way that you're not going to walk half the room, but you still mm. want to get your point of view out and your perspective and your true perspective like might walk half the room if you yeah. don't handle it in like a nuanced, smart way. That's like what stand-up is at its best kind of when you're not performing just for your audience specifically because – you're walking a tightrope, you know, you're like, I have these thoughts and I'm going to mm -hmm. 
get through. I, I, I could I could fall off on one side pretty easily, yeah. but I'm going to walk this tightrope where I'm going to thread the needle so that I'm going to get everyone in here to laugh, even though I'm expressing my political views, which half these people don't agree with. I'm going to yeah. find a common absurdity that I can make everyone laugh with, right? Yeah. And when you become like famous and then you have your audience coming out, you no longer have to thread the needle. It's not a tightrope mm. anymore. Now you're just watching someone walk down the street because there's no danger. They get to do exactly, they get to say it in a way for people who know how they feel, who already agree with how they feel, right? Mm. So stand up lets you be, you know, threading that needle is part of the challenge of it and part of the fun of it. And John, he, for years, he's, people know who he is. He's, he's cultivated his audience. There's always been a kind of core group of Fox News people who have always re respected him, I mm. think, but they're not going to like him. And he knows that. So he's ready for that type of backlash from that mm. element. He, he expects that. Uh, and that episode got a lot of backlash. And, but part of it really is because our show was built to like – we don't want to be CNN. We don't want to be like a news channel that has like, uh, you know, uh, again, tonight uh, uh, we're talking climate change. We have uh, a scientist who says it's real and then uh, some fucking crazy guy who says it's not. Now yeah, let's watch let's them. Put them in a fucking ring put and them in watch a cage them battle and, yeah. it out. Yeah. So like that's not the types of conversations we wanted to have. We wanted to have like smart, like thoughtful conversations with nuance, really talking about this stuff with people affected by it. The day before we filmed that episode, a guest – that was supposed to kind of speak uh, to the other side, but in a nuanced way, dropped out. He pulled out last minute. So mm. we were scrambling and we ended up uh, reaching out to Andrew Sullivan mm. because we needed someone and Sullivan is like willing to kind of take the, that type of stance. But he's not – we had a regular person and what we ended up getting was a pundit because we needed someone. And a, a, an interview with a pundit is a totally different thing. Yeah. They, they take their point of view and they're not looking to – have a conversation. They're looking to drive their point of view for because that's what they're essentially paid to you, do. You know what they're going to say before yes. they say it. I the show pundit. up. I, this is going to be my my take, and I'm not going to waver from it because yeah. that's what I've been trained to do. I, that's what makes entertaining TV essentially. Yeah. And so that kind of blew the whole episode up, and we kind of just had the wrong people. Period on that panel to some degree. Like that was just like, look, sometimes you're gonna like you're gonna you're gonna get some stuff wrong. Yeah. Uh, I if we could have redone that panel, I, I think we would. I enjoyed it. I I like the back and forth where it, it you you know the the premise of the episode. Obviously, you're you're tackling whiteness and white privilege with a group full of white people, and yes. some people. Some people are going to be uncomfortable. Some people are more full in like, no, like this is the problem with white people. And like, I'm white too. And I'm willing to just say, uh, you know, like I'm willing to divulge the whole problem. Other people may not disagree with whiteness being the reason for some of the discrepancies in society to the degree that the person is sitting next to them. Yeah. So I enjoyed it opening up with, um, it was just more of a, okay, everyone is on the same page about white privilege and whiteness. And then the guy on Zoom was that Andrew, Andrew Sullivan, Sullivan and yeah. he was just like, whoa, whoa, like, I don't, yeah. I don't agree with this. Uh, America's not racist. I, I'm not, or America's uh, not a white supremacy, yeah. but there is racism. And that to me was what made, uh, you know, j just like in that moment, I enjoyed that level of, Right. Comfortableness versus diciness versus like, how is this going to, how is this person going to respond? How is this guy going to respond to what she said, the back and forth and kind of, like you said, threading that needle of tension where you're navigating a very tense issue while also making it funny and also making it so the person doesn't walk their yeah. living room. Like they don't yes. change the channel. Totally. So yeah, and it ended up being, look, it was compelling, and uh, but like it, it was a lightning rod, and I don't know if it was ever a goal to make it a lightning rod, but we kind of knew, and we, look, we, we could have called that episode a lot of things and it ended up being called the problem with white people. So mm. we knew that was going to be, uh, that was going to get reactions as well. And we maybe we should have called it something else as well. Because to me, like controversy, it, it, it's fine, but I don't want it. I'd rather cut through the noise and make, you know, make some type of impact. Yeah. Uh, but I really, I think we all stand by the, what we call the act one of that show, that episode, which would be the desk piece monologue, John talking about the issue and walking yeah. through it. And I think that part lands uh, really well. And, and I think it's a really great, uh, I think it's just a really great piece. Yeah. And that also, that episode exposed 
the hackiness of a lot of the critics to that particular issue because at the end of the desk piece john was standing in front of the the problem with white people like mm-hmm. the whole the image and he's a white guy sitting in front of that phrase yeah. and he's like go have fun with this like yeah have fun twitter reddit whatever and then a lot of the videos that i came across going against it were like can you believe like a white guy sitting in front of the yeah. problem with white people and it's like he's that, like force feeding this to joke. you and yes. you didn't you either didn't watch the whole episode or you watched it and like didn't get essentially what yeah. he was doing which is fine like if you, if you don't get it or if you don't like it that's totally your decision but to see like just the difference in levels of people's uh sense of humor like sensibilities reacting to that episode that have built a living in media i'm like how do you not like you've been in this game so long how do you because not they know that more nuanced perspective they know it works yeah. they don't i don't think it's that they don't get it they just know like this is gonna rile people up they know most people didn't watch yeah. it because who the hell's watching apple tv yeah. plus anyway so they're like i'm just gonna fire this image out and, and get people mad and that's their whole mo you know were you writing for the show when the COVID lab leak monologue dropped on uh, Colbert, was mm-hmm. that during the, the yeah. during the show? Yeah. What was your initial reaction to seeing that? Like, did you have any idea that was going to happen? No, like- I uh, I think different people had different reactions. To me, like being a comic, I was like, "This is awesome. This is yeah. look. This is why." To me, that was a moment of like, "This is why John is the best," right? Because there was this like liberal orthodoxy out there that was like everyone. We, we're going to say that this thing was an accident that came from a market and that's no one's fault. And, and, and John was willing to like, for a joke that was a tight, really good, funny joke mm. was willing to buck the liberal orthodoxy. And he's on his friend, you know, Stephen Colbert's show yeah. and Colbert is like kind of sticking up for the orthodoxy of like, yeah. Oh, this, this is conspiracy. And, and it's like, people should be able to talk about stuff, you know, without being labeled conspiracy theorists. Like, instantly right and so john was joking but it was also a take of like what seems like there is this lab there it came from this place like we should probably acknowledge it's a possibility and he he, yeah he crushed with it he did it in the funniest way possible oh my god yeah it it was it was an eye-opening thing to see someone like if john stewart and stephen colbert were having that conversation like this right now just sitting on a couch i could see colbert going along with exactly what john stewart was saying and kind of like even feeding into it like oh yeah like uh you know it was fucking lab like chocolate factory all this shit and it was hilarious and you could see the tension in colbert's face and his demeanor where he's like ah like this is good but also i'm being paid by people to like not lean into this yeah like i can't lean into this as much as the inner comic in me wants to lean into this right now i can't really speak for him or what he's thinking or whatever but like it seems like from an outside perspective that like he is he feels like he is now like a mouthpiece for like the liberal orthodoxy so Mm -hmm. to speak and he kind of tries to stay within those parameters yeah yeah it, i mean whatever people think about john stewart i'll just my own opinion opinion on watching his his content and having seen him on the daily show up mm-hmm. until now he seems super authentic even you know no matter who's paying him he doesn't seem like a bot guy he seems like he's willing to just let it rip and that pisses a lot of people off but also a lot of people love it and it's really cool to see what you guys are doing Thanks. Yeah. It's, you know, John's big thing. uh, I think one of our like first, you know, days on the job was like, look, we're going to do some stuff that's going to piss off people on this side and that side. And like people aren't going to like some of it. They're going to overpraise some of it as well. And he's just like, the point is, it's like us in this room, we have to really believe what we're saying. The takes we got to be willing to stand by, really be invested in and know that, yeah, I feel good about this. And then that's our North Star. Mm. Like as long as we all believe in the take that's all that matters because people from everywhere are going to either overpraise it or absolutely like decimate it but either way like yeah. it's not about that it's about us believing that this is right so around I, I forget if it was around the same time or maybe schultz save america was before the covid lab leak monologue but yeah. I, you wrote for yes uh, four, three or four episodes on schultz save america yeah. 
I'm also a, a big fan of what those guys do over there. Yeah. The flagrant with Akash Singh and Andrew Schultz. What is it like going back and forth working with a guy like Andrew Schultz? Schultz is I love I love Schultz. He's like one of my close friends. And I love him to death. He's like and he's always been the sweetest guy to me. Uh, and Akash is one of my closest friends, Mark. The whole the whole flagrant crew. I love those guys. Yeah. I work with them like, you know, closely a lot of the time. Uh but Andrew and I align really closely on comedic sensibility. Yeah. You know, and then we're in a whole other world politically, right? So I can sit in and help them with like, you know, jokes and this and that and crafting a view. But in that room, it's like these guys are pushing in 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 this direction, you know, and I'm coming from a, basically the, the other side of the stuff. And mm -hmm. we're trying to meet in a place. And in some ways that mm -hmm. helps, that really helps you get a clear take as well. Because mm -hmm. we have, we're coming in from different angles, like politically. So what can we find? What's the thing that unites us both here? That's the thing that probably will, you know, hit most people viscerally in their gut as well. But then that's what you want. Most people say, yes, this is right. You really yeah. don't want that camp of like, you know, the 30% of people say this is absolutely right or absolutely wrong. Yeah. You know? I mean, the writing is so quick and it's so funny and like, just like super sharp. Cause that was the nature of the, the yeah. series before it dropped on Netflix. And it seems like, like you said, even though you guys are different politically there must have been something in that room to let the air out where it's like all right we view this this is what you think this is what i think but like let's just write funny shit and yeah. let's just figure out what works because like you can't write things that are that funny like you guys wrote without having that sense of we can just fucking let it rip and just yeah. see see what happens well, we just have a lot of fun and we yeah. like each other and you know like this is the thing like online or whatever when someone has like opposing political views you don't know them you don't know them as a person you just know their point of view and you don't like their point of view so you're like fuck this person mm. this person sucks but they're not they're just their political opinions they're a complex yeah. complicated person and maybe they hold some shitty opinions but maybe there's some great stuff about them too and like they're people so like i know these guys as people so i'm not like we never we, we don't even like we'll argue politics or whatever but it's not like ah, fuck you it's like ah, i yeah. think this i think who cares it's, we're making jokes it's, how do you differentiate between a comic who has a certain political view and a comic who's just taking that view to be funny or maybe it's like unexpected from what everyone else is doing and they're just like i'm just gonna fucking like do stop the steal jokes or Biden jokes, whatever it is right now, because that's the shit that people don't think I am. Like, is, is there a clear divide or is it more like we're just trying to do shit that's going to get a laugh? People who believe what they're saying and are also getting a laugh, it's it's always it's always good. It's better. Yeah. You know, it's like what you don't want is the person who's like, I'm going to be a contrarian for contrarian's sake. You yeah. know, like what's everybody saying? I'm going to say the opposite it's like no to, what do you believe do you believe the opposite awesome then let, let me yeah. see that take but do you believe w what everyone's saying okay then find a more interesting way mm. to say that but just that default of like i'm going to do the opposite it, it's it's just kind of boring yeah there it it seems like that is that's what separates the greatness of some jokes from the jokes are just that are just okay Be, the the willingness to take a point or perspective much further than it's usually taken yeah, or going against the grain, but finding a way to make it funny, like just being different. Cause there's a lot of content out there where I can sense, and I, I've fallen into this trap myself sometimes where I'm like, just because this is different means it's going to be good. And I'm like something different. I could make a barbed wire peanut butter sandwich. That's different. Sure, like yeah. someone's going to eat it and go to the hospital. Like uh -huh. it fucking sucked. It seems like there's a different level of thinking about shit where the great comics will take the different point of view. And they're like, okay, now how do I find like that small tunnel like that? I can just fucking like go through. That's going to make this different point of view relatable and resonate to people and not yeah. just be like, I'm being uh what do you like like I, i'm being uh get, getting a rise out of people just to get a rise out of people like no like there's actually a joke behind right. it yeah and finding ways to get messy you know I, i'm always a fan of of comedy that is like the like 
wrong conclusion, right reasoning, right? So like I used to do a joke years ago when they were talking about Idris Elba becoming mm. the next James Bond, mm. right? And in like liberal orthodoxy, it was like, oh, how cool would that be a black James Bond? You know, that mm. was kind of the pop culture take. And then there was some like voices that were like, James Bond should never be black or whatever. Mm. And so I used to do this joke saying like, uh, a lot of people are saying you can never have a black James Bond. And I think they're right. Because think of the crazy shit James Bond gets away with. You yeah. Know? <laughs> right. You know, like James Bond is pulling out a gun on top of a train. You think they're going to let, you know, uh, yeah. I, it's like been years since I've done the, oh, James Bond's always doing a, a buck 60 in an Aston Martin. You know what happens when black James Bond gets pulled over? Going yeah. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and to James Bond. So that's the joke where I'm like, I yeah. think I'm drawing the right, like I'm making the right observations and using it to draw the wrong conclusion, which is funny. Yeah. Yeah. The, the right observation, the wrong conclusion. Yeah. And that only works in the audience like it seems like that works when you give performers and when you give comedians the benefit of the doubt that this person doesn't actually believe that like they're they're coming to this conclusion yeah. because it it's ultimately part of the thing that makes that funny like it, it blows my mind sometimes the like like someone will see a for example in a, in a broadway play someone's getting raped or sexually harassed and it's like part of a performance mm -hmm. and that part of the play is you know it's it adds to their performance you you enjoyed it even though it's depicting something that is terrible right and then the same person will see a rape joke on stage and be like oh my god like that's that's terrible like how are you saying rape is okay and the the difference between like i don't know what it is maybe it's because comedy is such a uh like a pedestrian thing in the sense you can walk up on stage with a mic and there's not a lot of banners and other actors on stage like you're just saying shit to say it whereas there's more signals in other forms of yeah. arts where it's like this is a performance but it, it it always uh i'm like wow like how do you not know that this is a performance like this and you can be pissed off if you're pissed off. That's fine. But to be pissed off to think that this person actually thinks what they're saying, it's like, may, you know, like 95, 99 percent of the time they're trying to pull shit out of their brain and make yeah. it funny. Well, I think a lot of it is, you know, comics in general need to remember that like audiences, they don't they don't know you. Right. They don't. So. A lot of it is like, oh, oh, I can, I make these jokes. I make these jokes with my friends because they, they know where your heart is. They know mm -hmm. who you really are, right? So they know that this is just a joke. But when you go up to an audience, they don't know you. They're just seeing the stuff that you're saying. And so, yeah, if you're saying this stuff, especially if it's stuff you don't like believe necessarily, like it can come off pretty, pretty yeah. shitty. So like part of the, the goal of, of good comedy is like, it's also showing people where your heart is. It's showing them who you are so that when you make these jokes, they understand, you know, what, where it's coming from yeah, and what the ultimate point of the joke like is. Like when you're crossing the line, a piece of your heart comes with it. You're not just this, That's like right. you're, you're not this unlikable guy on exactly. stage because then you won't get the laugh. You're not just some edge lord who's trying to fucking make a yeah. rape joke to be like, there I like, <laughs> I like to offend people or there, whatever. Like, there you go. Uh, yeah. Plug, plug for the podcast. Uh -huh. um, you, you had a great quote on Twitter where you said, stand up is like diving or gymnastics. You have to take the degree of difficulty into account when watching it. And that was a quote about Maria Bamford oh, yeah. doing a, a late night set. Yeah. Uh, and she was doing s some material about death in the family. Like yeah. things that don't seem like it would be late night. -esque, right. And sh she was killing doing it. What's the highest degree of difficulty you would say that you've attempted to tell to I, tell a joke? Like I something have, that stands out. I have a, like a three minute chunk on school shootings. Uh, nice. And to me, that's like, there you go. that's about the highest degree of difficulty. What you're talking yeah. about is children being murdered in a place where they should be the safest they can be, essentially. Yeah. It's like that and at home are where they should be safe. And it's a tragic thing. And I have a joke about it. And the joke is really about how it's crazy how normal they've become to us. Like, again, it's one of these jokes I was doing five years ago, so I, I barely like her. But the point is, like, it's just, oh, it's like, it's barely even, like, news anymore. If less than a dozen kids get clipped, like, you know, like, I literally saw 
a story on CNN's website about a school shooting. It was between the headlines, uh, Sony edges Microsoft and best cities for young professionals. <laughs> so it's like PlayStation yeah. cooler than Xbox, kids killed at their desks. Check out Austin, cool music scene. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> just all mixed in yeah. together. How used to it can be eventually TV news will be like uh Oh, fuck, like, yeah, thanks for tuning in to whatever is it's uh, Yankees beat the Red Sox in their home opener, 78 degrees and sunny. And uh, yeah, 17 kids killed in a school shooting in yeah. Wisconsin. Uh, there you go. It's yeah. it's uh, it, it's becoming so common now that it's even casual to the, the police officers, like in the Uvalde shooting, like something that you would wait for backup for, like yes. a guy stealing uh, exactly. you, like a CD or something in a store. You're like, ah, like I'll finish my lunch before I so, go exactly. handle this. They're like treating school shootings like that. Like, oh, it's just a school yeah, shooting. Like, I'll just, just chill one. out, like see yeah. what happens and like wait for the, the border patrol to show yeah, up. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, um, but guys like me, and this is when, when I say like Schultz and I are like have the same comedic sensibility, it's like what we enjoy is high degree of difficulty comedy. Yeah. What did you think watching the, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial in terms of um, like f from a comedic standpoint, yeah. the one sidedness of Johnny Depp killing the tension in the courtroom making people laugh at times in a domestic violence uh defamation case yeah. like the most unfunny thing possible did you did you watch johnny depp like thinking oh wow his timing's good or like just from a comedic mind did, were I, you like what the fuck is this guy's killing right now i truly didn't watch any of it like i i watched none of it i i wasn't like super interested the whole thing seems kind of fucked up or whatever i just yeah. don't i don't even know like what's going on with it it seems not, not great but i will say like you know whenever you see like depictions of what the devil is like the devil is always very charming by nature like, yeah that's kind of the character of like if the devil is here on earth he's a little bit like that you know even like that devil's advocate or whatever like yeah and i think that is just like a it's a it's a thing to keep in mind that like charm yeah. can be great but it's, it's a real like weapon that lets you get away with that, stuff. that's true i mean that that seems like uh just in terms of going against the grain and i'm i myself think this as well like seeing johnny depp you're like oh he's a super likable guy he couldn't have done it i actually watched a, a good portion of the trial and so the evidence does seem to be against amber heard which they, they ultimately did you know like pay 10 million johnny depp or, or pay 10 million amber heard yeah. 2 million johnny depp so like most of it went to johnny depp but a take that not many people have said is like oh yeah like johnny depp super charming at the same time, like if a guy was doing that and getting away with it, this would be like the guy that would do it. Sure. Not that he actually did it, but just like the in terms of going through an opposite take, that seems like a good place to start if you want to go against the grain. Like what are people not saying about this pop cultural phenomenon yeah. right now? I will say just like in general, without knowing anything about this like trial, really like anyone who's been very famous from the time they're a teenager who's now an adult, like they're, they're fucked up because you just can't not be like mm. fame is a thing that really like kind of breaks you as the younger you get it, the worse it is. And if you've been that famous for that long, it's just kind of impossible to be yeah. like grounded. And we have no tools to combat it at all. Cause we've grown up in just like uh, human beings in general, you evolve in tribes, you know, maybe 150 people throughout your life before technology comes along for thousands of years. And then within a blink of time, you have billions of people knowing who you are, getting one-sided input from all these people who feel like they know you right. at a deep level. And you're this, per like they're seeing a 0.2%, less, even less than that slice of you. And you're this whole other person most of the time, whether that's a positive or negative or most likely a, a combination of that. It has to be just fucking just crazy and hilarious. I'd have to feel like sometimes where you're like, this is so weird. It's fucking hilarious. Like, how else do I deal with this besides either going off the deep end yeah. or laugh at how crazy the situation is? Like, I, I can't imagine what it's like to to be in a situation where you're a star from, you know, 15 years old. Yeah. And yeah. people, you just, people just get used to what they get used to, you know? So it's like, let's say every time you walk into a restaurant, whether there's a wait or not, they 
find a table for you and, and you get to sit down. And one day you go to a restaurant and they don't do that, then without even like thinking you're being a dick, you're going to be like, oh, do you know who I am? Mm. Because you're like, oh, maybe you just don't know, but I'm a guy who I always just get sat. Yeah. It just becomes your reality. And then when that gets broken in any way and you have to live like a regular person for a minute, it's like, it's it's frustrating. It's enormous. Yeah. makes you angry. I wanted to to end off with a couple articles that you published on Medium. Okay. One of them is about your brother that passed away yeah. a couple years ago. And I'm sorry to to hear that. I have an older brother as well, so I can't imagine what it's like to, to go through that. Yeah. You wrote an article, uh, a very touching, very uh, just... Uh, like I felt connected reading the article about about your brother Galad. Is that how you yeah, pronounce Gilad. it? Yeah, Galad. Yeah, you wrote about Galad. It was so easy to spend time with Galad. He had so many stories and was always happy to tell them. Of course, you rarely got the story the way it happened. You got the story the way it was meant to happen, and in a lot of ways, it was better than that. The world of Galad's stories was fantastical and magical, and probably a better place than the reality we live in. You could call him on his lies, exaggerations, fabrications, but to what end? And I wanted to ask you, because I'm someone who uh, also grew up with an older brother. What was your relationship like with Galad and and some of the stories that you guys would tell back and forth? Because I feel like I can tune into yeah. a little window of what you were writing about. It was, I mean, he would love to tell stories about the thing. Yeah, he grew up in England for the most part. Uh, and and the, the things he would do with his, you know, friends when he was a, you know, younger, a teenager or whatever. And then we'd go to like, you know, a music festival. And, and uh, you know, there was, a, it's just stories where like we, you know, kids being kids doing stuff, but it's like, you know, they're like, oh, we, we uh, gave, you know, what, whatever, uh, Bryn, one of, like we gave him like a, a weed brownie and he didn't know that's what it was. And then yeah. suddenly he's like, and now the story's turned up to 11. He's tripping balls yeah. but he doesn't know what's going on and none of us tell mm. him and he's scared. He thinks he needs to go yeah. to a hospital. It's just like everything is dialed up to like exactly the way you would want it to go yeah, if you exactly. pulled like some type of trick like this. And it's like, that seems like, it seems like a little bit of a stretch or, or whatever. But it was often like stories about, yeah, him in their like younger years and yeah. him and his friends and the type of stuff that they would do and it was always just like nothing ever goes this perfectly when you do it's always like kind of mayhem especially when yeah. you're dealing with you know five dumb 21 year old dudes yeah uh, but he would just tell stuff the way it, it should have gone I, I had a few friends like that in college that were just absolutely insane storytellers where you would think they would just practice it every day and in a way they were because i i was playing baseball in college guys would be in a locker room and you tell a story and if people don't like what you're saying they're just like shut the fuck up. like you're not keeping my attention anymore yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. we're gonna go leave and, and drink or go to class or something like that and there would be times where i'm listening to someone tell a story in college one of my best buds maybe i'm there and i know the story didn't happen the way that he's saying it did and in my mind i'm calling this person out for it and then you know later in my washed up college baseball career i had the realization where i'm like if someone's telling a story and they're not hurting someone why not just let them fucking tell the yeah. punch up version of it just, like it's not doing anything it's a better story because of that we're all they're having actually a better time. killing right now in a locker room full of guys yeah. um it's not easy to do and it's just like this pure storytelling ability which it, it sounds like there's a lot of crossover with your brother yeah that's exactly right yeah yeah yeah, just a, a, a charming and great storytellers. And really, like it was, I, I mean that genuinely. It was like the world of the stories is kind of just a better, it's a better world. Yeah. You know, if only everything went the way we wanted it to go. It, uh, was it a, a surprise when he passed away? Like, was it an expected thing? Yeah, it was. It? He had, well, he had brain cancer okay. and he had like, what the, he had the surgery like kind of eight years before he passed away and things were like really good. And then he had to go in for another surgery that was like, kind of sold as like, hey, it's a follow up. There's a bit of danger, but you should be fine. It was kind of routine. And then yeah. everything, after that second surgery, things just went downhill fast. Yeah. I, I really, I resonated with the part of the article where, you were talking about how your brother would take you to events and wouldn't treat you like you were the the younger brother. Yeah. And my older brother is eight, eight and a half years older yeah, than me. So, so, so there's a, there's much more of a divide than there is normally. Like yeah. me and my younger brother is a year and a half. And it was the same way when he was hanging out with his friends in high school or when I would go visit him in college at Boston University. Like 
it's just sitting at a pregame before guys went out. I'm just a fucking, you know, 11, 12 yeah. year old kid. But at no point in my life did I feel like I was a nuisance to my older brother when I was like yeah. I, looking back at it. I'm like, I was of a course fucking I was, yeah. piece of shit for, you know, from eight to 12 years old when I was hanging out with my brother, I was always like being a bother to him. My brother's just trying to do college things like get fucked up, hang out, go places. And I never uh, I never felt like I was being a bother to my older brother and I, I always appreciated that yeah to not be made to feel like a, just a, like a dumb kid who's tagging along but just yeah. like hey this is my brother he's gonna be here it's like that you get afforded this level of like respect that you don't often get from like someone yeah. who's kind of a grown-up and probably someone you look up to and like and the patience that they show and like doing that because clearly like a, it's not fun for a 20 year old to hang around with a 12 year old in a lot of ways but 100 like, you know it is there's so much grace there it's uh, when you look at it look back as a grown up you're like oh it's that's very touching yeah, yeah. and it it makes me have a higher barrier to deal with annoyance with cousins or people who are younger than me where i'm like i was doing worse than this shit like i'm literally you know my my brother's hanging out and i'm like fucking purposely shaking up drinks that my brother and his friends are doing right. yeah, or yeah, yeah. I, i'm i'm just like just like annoying shit and so now when i see people in my family that are doing nowhere near the amount of annoying things that i was i'm just like yeah it's you know this is this is what it is like it's just you're hanging out with this person yeah that's that's right so you wrote uh to end off on this a great point to end off you know two hot men sitting here on a podcast uh, -huh. uh you wrote an article the seven hottest men in stand-up <laughs> a few years back and so yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about a few of these men yeah because yeah. there's uh some pretty some pretty stunning pictures in this article uh -huh. and so i wanted to uh get your take on who these men are and what they mean to you okay so the first picture i have here and i'll throw these up on the, the video version as well uh -huh. It is uh, Robbie Slowick, the clean, the clean Christian comic. Oh yeah, there just I to, am. Just to jog your memory, there I am with with JC himself up on the cross. Yeah. T tell me about this man and the time he spent with JC. What what led to uh, that yeah. period of Robbie Slowick? Got it. So that the cl uh, clean Christian comic, from my experience with clean Christian comics, uh, goes around the country and does uh, very. Uh, standard jokes for the where churches are paying you a good uh two grand to do it and then you end up uh, that's good they actually are <laughs> for, for like an hour for an hour of wow. stuff and it's all very specific to the church and then usually you try to fuck one of the women there uh even though you're a christian comic and and, and that's very that's very on it. point for the the catholic church like being <laughs> yeah. supposedly being celibate and then fucking people's brains out yes. after that. yes yeah yeah yeah, there yeah, you yeah. Go. that's that's the christian comedy circuit for sure so for the next picture, uh -huh. and this will be the last picture, Robbie Slowick, uh, the best looking man in comedy, uh -huh. Robbie Slowick, uh, this was now, I assume, when you wrote the article, yeah. this was back in 2016. It God, says, that long ago. Yeah. It says, objectively, the best looking man in stand-up comedy, Robbie Slowick, this was determined scientifically by a panel of experts. Yes. Unfortunately, he, he is not funny. <laughs> so from a, from a pure scientific standpoint- uh -huh which is what this podcast is all about, yes. you know, bringing science yes. to life in, God, in the finally. form of conversation. Yeah. yeah. Is there any truth to the fact that if you are better looking, you will be less funny on stage or just better looking people in general are not funny? No, I used to think that. I used to think like it was, it doesn't make sense to be good looking and funny, but there's like- And then you saw yourself? Th yes. And I looked in the mirror and I was crushing and I was like, no, clearly it's possible. Clearly yeah. it can be done. Yeah. What form are you currently? What what form of Robbie Slowick are you right now? Would you say? Oh, uh, I well, I, I think since 2016, I, I've lost some hotness. Unfortunately, mm. I think I'm still doing okay, but like I, I definitely, you know, some I lost a little bit of hair on top. Still, still keeping, you know, a lot oh, of there it. You but go. I could use, you know, I could use a little Flowing. bit more coverage up there. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's all about just just piecing it together so people think that the puzzle is 100 percent there that's what i plan on doing that's when the, the pipes start to come in yeah, it's yeah, like yeah you need to cut off a little bit comb it over you look like you make sure the like you, uh, an aerial view on top make sure like it looks clean yeah, yeah and then yeah. when people get up close that's when you just start like backing up subtly where you're like i, I can't let you have this you view can't right let now. them get up close you yeah. never let them get up yeah. close that's it's a secret. mirage yeah it's a mirage but th thank you so much for for taking the time to, thank you for to having hop me, on the man. show this, this, was, really this was a blast and uh 
Yeah, this was this was fun. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank and, you. And uh, for people listening to the podcast, um, I'm gonna put in your Instagram. Cool. Which, is that at Robbie? Is that Robbie Slovic? Yeah. Uh, Twitter is also at Robbie Slovic, and then uh, I, I the pap podcast we mentioned the edge lords mm. that's all on youtube now or you can download it we don't do that one anymore and then you can hear me regularly on the podcast with john stewart uh the problem with john stewart podcast as well. awesome thank yeah. you robbie thank you appreciate it